Lots of businesses talk about solving consumer headaches, but it's much more literal for today's guest. Founder and CEO Eric Kanarawala woke up with a terrible headache one morning that was made even worse by trying to deal with the pharmacy. $600 million and seven years later, Capsule is taking the friction out of the consumer experience, driving improved fill rates, and saving physician offices dozens of hours a month each. In this episode of the Health Biz Podcast, Eric shares his life and career story, and he leaves us with three inspiring book recommendations from the nonfiction and fiction realms. I'm your host, David Williams, president of strategy consulting firm Health Business Group. If you like what you hear, please press that like button. Eric Kanariwala, founder and CEO of Capsule. Welcome to the Health Biz Podcast. Hi, David. Thanks for having me on. You know, it's nice to, to meet you, and I hope I passed the first test of pronouncing your, your name right. I, I try to get the name uh, right. I had the hardest one that I had was a guy named uh, Mohan Jiri Daradas. And I figured I'd listen to another podcast ahead of time and, you know, and pick up the name. Anyway, the host just said, uh, your name's too hard. I'm not going to pronounce it. I'm like, what the heck? You know, that's, <laughs> that's lame. Check it out. <laughs> Thanks for nailing mine. I appreciate it. Anyway, great. So we're going to talk about all the exciting things that you're doing with Capsule, but I want to talk first about how you got there. So would love to talk a little bit about your upbringing. What was your childhood like? Any childhood influences that have stuck with you throughout your career? Sure. Uh, you know, I grew up in suburban Detroit, uh, about a half hour in a suburb, about a half hour north. And, you know, my mom, uh, my mom is a, an entrepreneur uh, in the financial services space and has her own small business. Uh, my dad's a mechanical engineer. And I think like all kids, probably like I'm a, I'm a pretty perfect, you know, cross of, of the two yeah. of them, but for sure, um, you know, for sure, I think seeing, seeing my parents just work really hard, like very classic, you know, kind of immigrant story, um, but seeing them work you know, really hard. And I think seeing, uh, seeing my mom just kind of start her business, grow her business and both the, I think the rewards and also the challenges of um, of that were, were really inspiring for me. Um, and so that was sort of always planted, uh, you know, an entrepreneurial bug, um, you know, somewhere deep I- inside of me and then spent, you know, had spent the early part of my career, uh, you know, post-college as, uh, as an investor investing in, you know, what seemed like an odd combination of things when I was 25, but, you know, retail, healthcare and tech and looking back on that makes a lot of sense because our business is at the intersection of those three things. But that was a really good foundation. Those early years uh, as an investor was a really good foundation in understanding markets and understanding businesses and business models. But also, you know, I think the thing that's probably most applicable to being an entrepreneur and growing a business is how do you make decisions with imperfect information? uh, And what's your process to do that? And how do you get comfortable with the discomfort of not having all the of, of all the information and yet staff, still having to like move forward every day and and make those decisions and then I think the discipline of being able to make sure that you're learning from the decisions you make uh, and revisiting you know your assumptions and like do we get that right do we get that wrong and I think that's served us really well as we built the business on the product side on the operation side on hiring you know all of the places where you're have a hypothesis and you're taking the best available intuition and data you have, uh, making a decision. And then, you know, how do you make that loop faster and better? I think in some ways is the core, is the core thing about building and running a yeah. business. It's just a series of decision loops. And how do you get faster, better, stronger at those over time? Yeah, I want to uh, highlight something you said earlier in, in your response about sort of the, you know, the classic immigrant upbringing. And as a proponent of immigration for many reasons, including what it does uh, for the economy, I just I hope that the classic immigrant experiences can continue, uh, if not to, uh, not to grow, because it's good for, good for the U.S. and it's good, it's good for the economy, particularly for entrepreneurial activity, in my opinion. You mentioned you're talking about um, investing. I noticed, you know, as a management consultant myself, I noticed you spent at least some time at Bain and Company. Uh, how was that? Uh, it was great. I was at Bain Capital, uh, which has a heavy influence from, of course, Bain and Company, and uh, you know a lot of the a lot of the individuals that worked there had, had set some of their career at at some point at Bain and Company, and so got. I like to think that I got you know some of the best of what I would have gotten if I had worked at Bain and Company, with maybe some ad- additional exposure to you know investing in the markets, but uh, have a lot of respect for 
for that company and that culture and just has, has done an amazing job, both the consulting side and the investing kind of, um, you know, the, the bank capital um, organization, just really talented people, um, very well run, which isn't the case for all investment organizations. Yeah. You know, a lot of times investing companies really are, um, you know, six guys around a table and, you know, bank capital has grown a lot since I was there. It's been, it's been, it's been a minute, but um, was always well run, you know, amazing training, amazing talent selection, you know, just all of the hallmarks of a great organization. I think that was a fantastic first experience for me to have a mental model of just like, what does good look like? Um, yeah. and how do you build a high performing company and how do you build a high performing culture and what, 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 you know, how do, how do you set up people for success and what does all of that look like? Um, and what does high quality work look like? And I think all of those things have been really beneficial, um, on, on our journey. That makes sense. Well, yeah, I was at Boston Consulting Group and uh, was there later than the founding of Bain, but uh, Bill Bain was at Boston Consulting Group and, and left there. And they used to, there was another guy named Bill Bain at Boston Consulting Group. And they used to talk about the good Bill Bain and the bad Bill Bain. I'll, I'll let you guess which was which. Was which. But, uh, you know, two, two stellar organizations. Let's talk about Capsule. Um, I'm interested in kind of what's the founding story? I mean, why did this company need to exist in the first place? Sure. Uh, the, the founding story is I... Woke up one morning in 2015, and I had a I had a killer headache, and I called my doctor, and he asked me a series of questions, and you know, and said, "Hey, don't worry about it. You've got a sinus infection. I'll call a prescription and go get it." And I said, "Perfect." And so, I was living on the Lower East Side of New York, uh, New York City at the time, and put my coat on and went out in this cold, snowy January day, and went to my local chain pharmacy around the corner. Uh, and David, everything you can think about going wrong at the pharmacy happened to all go wrong for me in the same time and same place. Uh, you know, starting with the fact that I'm wandering around the store and I can't actually find the pharmacy and it turns out it's in this dark, dingy basement. So I navigate my way through this broken escalator down there and there's, you know, dozens and dozens of people in line ahead of me and my cell phone isn't getting signal because I'm in the basement and my head's still throbbing and, you know, I end up waiting in line for an hour. I get to the counter and, and finally, you know, the pharmacist uh you know it's like hey how can i help you know my doctor called the prescription in and she's you know pleasant but clearly overworked and goes back to the you know stock room and, and tries to find it and comes back and it's like i'm really sorry we're out of stock and i have this moment of like it's a z-pack it's january like this feels like the only thing you should have in stock and anyway i try to call my doctor to have him write it somewhere else but my cell phone of course has now died searching for signal in the basement so long story short i you know ended up going home no medication in hand and i woke up the next morning and I had one of those moments where it's like, what, what is going on? Like, how does this work? Why does this exist? And the spark, you know, the spark for Capsule was really just me unpacking my own personal experience. And very quickly as I was doing that, uh, I started to understand that some of the things I had learned as an investor and that some of the themes that I was investing behind, um, you know, namely this idea that local commerce is really transitioning and digitizing very aggressively, uh, that the world of healthcare slowly but surely is, is moving to a world where um, people are incentivized for, uh, you know, the health outcomes they're able to deliver versus, you know, just the amount of healthcare they deliver uh, and, and realize that the pharmacy sat at this, you know, one could say intersection. I like to think it's at the intersection of those two things. Um, the reason the business exists is because it sits, at, there's a gap between those two things. And, and that crevice is that pharmacies, historically conventional pharmacies have been organized in this, you know, I like to kind of play this thought experiment around, which is like, if you were from Mars and you came to earth and you walked into a chain pharmacy, man, you'd be awfully confused, right? Like, yeah. why, it's like, wait a minute, why are you selling Twizzlers, but also insulin? Why do yeah. you sell cigarettes and Chantix? Like, this is confusing to me. It and is. I think it's actually, if you step back, it's confusing to everyone. And, um, and I think the, that that core of core, core insight is like hey, half this half of the way it's been set up is the focus is on traditional conventional retailing things, uh, and half of it is on pharmacy and healthcare and uh, and as a result, I don't think they do either of those things particularly well. And you've started to see over the last ten years that front part of that store um, really get disaggregated by companies like Amazon and Instacart and GoPuff and and others. Um, and, and Capsule and, and other digital pharmacies are starting and, you know, I think we're probably more than starting, but feels like we're just starting given the size yeah. of the opportunity, um, are, you know, just aggregating the back of that to deliver 
a healthcare first, better digital experience. And, and the core insight, I think there's So just to be clear, so it seems like, so, you know, so it seems like now I got the vision for the company is that when the Martians arrive, they'll be able to go into the store and they'll be, you know, be clear on what they're supposed to do. Well, there will be no store because the Martians will like everybody else be using their mobile they'll, they'll sign in they'll, yeah. they'll use the yeah, exactly they'll use their uh, their satellite phone or whatever they may they may have with them and also that this is a business like literally born from a headache you know and it's like it was a headache like talk about having a headache that you're resolving or, or pain point it was really that i had another guest on the show who actually i think had um dislocated his shoulder and he went into the hot the doctor's office and they were having him fill out these forms and so he came up with a business to like do a form filling that you didn't need to be uh signing all the papers and all that so it's i guess it's good that you had that that headache uh, way back then and got to experience the the worst of it. You know, what is sort of, what is the overall solution that you have? Like, how do you, how do you actually solve this problem? Yeah, so how? it's a it's a really good question. So the, the way you solve it is by first principles, understanding, like, what is the problem? And we identified three problems that are at the core of what we've built. The first is... Uh, the first is that the, the consumer experience is high friction. And I don't think that's like a novel like insight, yet it was an unaddressed insight, right? So long wait times, persistent out of stocks. I can't get advice about my medication or my insurance in any sort of timely, secure, private, discreet way. Um, I don't know the price, you know, price transparency. I don't know the price of the thing until I've actually already paid for it, right? Like all of these things that we've all just taken for granted in engaging with the pharmacy. So that was one. Um, and, and part and parcel of that was like, wow, I didn't realize 70% of American adults went to the pharmacy at least once a month. So this is like omnipresent yet invisible part of the healthcare infrastructure is the pharmacy. Everyone uses it. It's terrible. It's low NPS. It's like all of the things. So that was kind of problem one. And problem two uh, is that an insight to is, is that, gosh, like the pharmacy is the most frequent interaction point in the entire healthcare system. The average person interacts with the pharmacy eight to 10 times more often than they do with their doctor. And so that's a really important fact as we think about how do you, how do, ultimately, how do you bend the cost curve in healthcare? People need to make better different decisions. And so how do people make better different decisions? Like, well, people make better different decisions when they have information that they trust and from people they trust and from companies and brands they trust. And trust is a function of frequency of interaction. And then the third insight is that it turns out it's not just the consumer that has a lot of friction with the pharmacy. And, and so... Coming out of that terrible drugstore experience I had, of course, I went and started talking to people I knew and consumers and friends and said, hey, you know, tell me about your experience with the pharmacy. But then I started having that same conversation with doctors and I started having that conversation with people that run insurance companies and people that run drug companies and health systems. And they all started echoing the same thing, David, right? It's like the way this thing is set up isn't set up to help me take care of the people I got to take care of. And that was a, that was a light bulb for me and said, gosh, like, there, there's a better way to build what this is that not only creates an amazing, simple, delightful customer experience and solves all those friction points that you and I and your audience face day to day, but how, how do you solve the problem for the doc who interacts with the pharmacy 20 times a day and the insurance company that pays hundreds of billions of dollars for drugs and the drug company who makes all these novel therapies and is sort of disconnected from the consumer? And that was really the insight. And so the, the way to go about solving that is you got to start with, the, I think our belief is you have to start with the consumer and the customer and solve the problems they have. And so that's where we started. We built, we took a blank sheet of paper and we said, hey, if the pharmacy were built today in 2015, not in you know 1895 or yeah. whatever, when they first started, what would you do? And it's like, well, I would solve price transparency. I would solve the ability to access a pharmacist when and how I want. I would solve, you know, making sure the medications my doctor prescribes are in stock. I would solve making sure I never run out of refills and coordinate with the insurance, right? I would do all of these things, which is what we did when we started. I would bring it to your house um, because that's, I think, going to be table stakes for modern retail. It's going to be delivery. And and that's where we started. So we built this really simple, mobile first, modern consumer experience for the pharmacy, the way it works. You know, people can use it in one of two ways. You can either go to the website, download the app, put in five pieces of information and Capsule becomes your pharmacy and you can go through and get and manage your medications. The other way is even easier. You literally just tell your doctor your pharmacy is Capsule. We get the prescription. Um, you know, we look up your insurance. You can text or chat with us about questions along the way. You schedule free delivery and it shows up at your house or your office. Um, and then, you know, the next month and the next month, we're making sure that we um, are ahead of you 
uh, and making sure that we're bringing that medication to you when you when and how you need it. And so that's like kind of the core way you solve the consumer problem. Yeah. And then we've also built a number of tools for for doctors to streamline their workflows and and increasingly partnering you know on the value based care side with insurers and drug companies. Yeah, I like those. Uh, the way, first of all, from even if you weren't a consultant, you're being capital. There's always three things, so it was good. There were three things. Always, always three, three things, things in consultants. Yeah. So, so that was good, and I think that um, you yeah, know that consumer experience was interesting. There, there, there's a couple points in there that are, I think, if not novel insights, they're they're quite interesting. About you know how the pharmacist is very well trusted, and you're mentioning that's frequency of interaction, which is an interesting point for why that is. And then also, I think with everybody has their own frustrations. You know, they don't realize the frustrations of of others, even though when you call the pharmacy, you know, it says, you know, press one for the hours or menu of change, blah, 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 blah. And it's, you know, if you're a doctor, press this number and, you know, people are on hold from the physician office as well. And I know that I know there's a lot of friction there. So I'm glad you've done that. I don't have a headache listening to it. It sounds it sounds marvelous. What impact have you had? The primary impacts are a couple of things. So one, uh, consumers love it. And so the NPS of our business is incredibly high. The retention of people continuing to use capsule to get manager medications month after month is really, really high. Uh, the second is that we drive 50% better fill rate. So in America, on average, across all prescriptions, one out of two prescriptions goes unfilled. And that figure at capsule is 50% better because we've reduced the friction of getting and managing medications. So that's a really big impact in terms of just making sure you, know, you can't take medications that you don't get. No. Uh, and so that's you know a really big impact. And then you know, on the doctor side, uh, through the number of tools that we've built, we're saving doctors, you know, tens, you know, tens and tens and tens of hours a month um, in reduced, you know, in just reduced administrative burden um, for their staff. And I think in a time like today where doctors and their staff are more burned out than ever before, um, looking after, you know, those people is really important as well. So, you know, what you're taking on is a, is a big ambition. So pharmacies, you know, tens of thousands of pharmacies, hundreds of billions of dollars of drugs being paid for, doctors, patients, all of this. It's got to be a big undertaking in order to build something at, at scale. And I know you've raised significant funds. What has the funding path been like for the company? Sure. Uh, there's a little bit under $600 million of capital, you know, into the business over multiple rounds of financing. And, uh, and I think we've done a really good job of partnering with, uh, investors that believe and understand our, the long-term ambition and opportunity to build something really different in terms of how people are not only getting their medications and managing their medications, but broadly their healthcare with the pharmacy as the first part of that because it's the highest frequency place, but over time uh, layering in additional things that reduce friction for the consumer. Um, and I think that, you know, I think that the the business has a, uh, a fairly large amount of infrastructure, both physically, but also, you know, perhaps hidden because I think we've made the consumer experience so simple. It, it belies the complexity of the technology that under, that underpins everything we do. And so build, you know, building that technology infrastructure obviously is super valuable and enables the business to scale and enables that delightful experience for the doctor and the consumer and enables us to deliver that better outcome for, you know, folks that are paying for all the medications. Um, but, you know, all of that obviously requires investment uh, up front uh, and along the way to do. Uh, I think we've been fortunate to have really supportive long term partners to, to do that with. So, you know, you started the business at a, a pretty good time, 2015, as you said, and then we had the pandemic and a real sort of digital health boom slash frenzy uh, around the way. And now we're in a different spot in, in 2022. As you look at digital health today you know, around, you know, the middle of 2022, What's your perspective on that on that space and, and how Capsule fits into it? I think long term, it's very hard to make the argument that more people are not going to be engaging with their healthcare digitally in five years, 10 years or 20 years than they do today. I think that is feels nothing's indisputable, but that feels pretty close to truth. Uh, I think what's up for debate is the pace at which that's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, and where that's going to happen. And I think one of the things that as a broad thing we saw during the pandemic was that not only did people sort of increase their belief or estimate of where of how much of healthcare would be digitized, they pulled forward the time that would happen and extrapolated the growth rates from the pandemic. And 
uh, and hindsight's twenty twenty, of course. But I, I, you know, I think those were probably not like appropriate assumptions with which to operate yeah. with. And so, you know, I think that I think that healthcare will digitize. I don't think it's going to happen. I don't think all of it's going to happen in every segment overnight. I do think the pandemic was a catalyst for a lot of different par- health parts of healthcare to kind of reevaluate their workloads, and people did have to overnight digitize those things. But consumer behavior in different categories evolves at different paces. And and I think that healthcare, for a variety of reasons, both because it's high trust, because it's habitual, because the demographics of the people that consume healthcare the most are often the people that are kind of the latest adopters of new ways of doing things. There's a lot of different characteristics of, about healthcare that suggest that maybe that, um, you know, that evolution is gonna happen at a different rate than than you know some other folk, you know some other categories that have happened in the past, but I think no doubt you know, you're going to continue to see healthcare digitized more. I think one of the things that we learned about our business, um, one of the things that we're seeing in our business is that the people that started using Capsule during the pandemic are actually retaining, you know, and their frequency of usage is actually slightly uh, higher than than people who started using Capsule, you know outside of the pandemic. And I think one of the big concerns um, for companies that saw, uh, you know, some increase in, in demand during the pandemic was that, you know, is this going to be sticky as the world opens back right. up? And I think we'll see in other categories. But for us, you know, we're seeing that once people try um, a better way of getting and managing medications, they absolutely want to continue doing that. Um, and I think the other piece for us is that the, the pharmacy is effectively, you know, we could debate what other categories, but the pharmacy is effectively the most consumerized part of right. the healthcare system. The pharmacy has always been by and large consumer driven, uh, right? Like you and I pick what pharmacy yeah. we go to by and large. Right. And so I think of all of the things that are going to lead that adoption curve, you know, we think the pharmacy is, is, is really well yeah. positioned to be at the forefront of how, of how healthcare digital. Well, I think it's also, it's not just, uh, you know, what I was thinking when you were talking about there was about, first of all, that kind of time frame. We had done work in 2020, right before the dot com crash on, you know, doctor patient web based communications. It was right after Hotmail was sold to Microsoft. There were 20 companies doing, doing this. And, you know, it just took a long time. And I'd written blog posts about it. And every five years, you could go back and write the same one. You know, there'd, there'd be a headline that would say, you know, take two aspirin and email me in the morning. You could see how this is going to happen. And then the pandemic all of a sudden went from 2% to 80%. But now what's happened is that the even though that the pharmacy, as you're describing it, there's friction for all these different parties, it's still more consumer driven. So the consumer isn't the only one that decides if they're having a telehealth visit. It's up to their doctor. It's more up to their insurance company. And at least as it relates to the pharmacy, your choice of pharmacy and whether you're getting, in most cases, whether you're going to go in mail order, whether you're going to get delivered, whether you're going to go in, in person is more in the, in, in the hands of the consumer. Now, having said that, uh, you know, there's these pharmacy benefit managers that have their own interests at stake as well. And in some cases, although they've generally allowed very broad network or sort of any willing provider, there are some moves, I think, to narrow it. And I don't know whether you're seeing that and, and if it affects what you're doing. We're not seeing a lot on the narrow, you know, I think, again, it depends on the segment. I think, you know, the Medicare segment has always had you know, some narrowing of the, of the network. Uh, we're not by and large seeing, um, narrower networks. And I think one of the reasons that I, I don't think you're going to see that happen in spades is a couple reasons. I think that if you look at what's happened in the PBM space over 10 years, all of the PBMs are now embedded inside of, uh, you know, insurance companies. Yeah. Uh, Express Scripts is with Cigna, Caremark is with Aetna, and Optum is with United Healthcare. And what you should see, which is good for everyone, is what what you should see is that the the entire me, the entire healthcare spend now both pharmacy and medical benefit should be getting managed together as opposed to separately. And what you used to have when they were separate was this very classic balloon squeezing problem, yeah. where a pharmacy benefit manager would go to insurance and say, "Hey, good news, we restricted the pharmacy network, or we put prior authorizations in, and you know we we did all these things that created friction." Uh, and we saved, you know, we reduced the drug trend from 3% increase to 50 bips. And the insurer would probably look at the PBM and say, that's great. By the way, like my medical ben- expenses for the people you made it harder to get insulin yeah. for just skyrocketed way more than right. whatever money you saved me on the pharmacy. Right? And so the right way to manage that 
is in aggregate. Yeah. And the right way to manage the pharmacy network uh, is to really look at the pharmacies that are delivering better outcomes, right? And though outcomes can be consumer experience, they can be adherence, they can be you know, clinical excellence. There's a number of different things. And I think we feel really good about on all dimensions where we stack up against what exists today. And, and so in some ways, you know, to the extent there is going to be more discernment around what pharmacies uh, are around, um, you know, we feel really good both about the cost structure that we've enabled through technology, but also the outcomes that we deliver by having a different, better model. Great. So just to wrap things up, I want to ask you if you've had a chance to read any books these days, if there's anything that you uh, may recommend to our listeners or, or in fact recommend that they avoid. Oh, I've never been asked what book should I avoid. That's a really yeah. good question. I, I'll probably not take you up on that one. Okay. But um, on the first one, uh, I've got two book recommendations. The one we give everybody when they start at Capsule, it's called uh, On the Wings of Eagles. Uh, and it's a true story um, with Ross Perot as yeah. the protagonist. And it's just this unbelievable adventure. It reads like fiction, it's nonfiction. Uh, and it's this unbelievable story of what I think about as like company loyalty and teamwork. Um, and it's it's just a really cool adventure book, but there, I think there are some broader lessons to learn about what it really truly means to to be a leader and to build an organization and what are the lengths you would go to for the people that um, are on your team. So I love that book and we give that to everybody at Capsule when they start. Um, I really like the Checklist Manifesto. It's super simple, it's short. A lot of the examples in it are from inside of healthcare. There are outside of healthcare examples, but I think it just reinforces for me that in a world that's increasingly complex, sometimes the simplest solution is the best solution and can have a lot of impact. And so a lot of times you don't need to make things crazy complicated to have really high impact. Um, and it's a good reminder for our team. Um, those are two. And then a third book that I'll just recommend just for fun, um, that's also nonfiction, but reads like fiction, uh, is a book called The Traitor and the Spy, which is a story about the highest level uh, sort of spy that infiltrated um, during the Cold War and then how, how sort of that unwound. Uh, and it's a, it's a page turner. Um, but those are my three book recommendations. Excellent. It's like always three things, but uh, I'm glad there's three books and uh, we won't, we won't put you on the spot about one to avoid, but if I'll, I'll if I read any that, that allows, I usually just put it down. So it's just like, I avoid it after the first few pages, but well, great. Well, Eric Canariwala, founder and CEO of Capsule. Thanks for joining me today on the Health Biz Podcast. Thanks for having me, David. Appreciate it. You've been listening to the Health Biz Podcast with me, David Williams, president of Health Business Group. I conduct in-depth interviews with leaders in healthcare business and policy. If you like what you hear, go ahead and subscribe on your favorite service. While you're at it, go ahead and subscribe on your second and third favorite services as well. There's more good stuff to come, and you won't want to miss an episode. If your organization is seeking strategy consulting services in healthcare, check out our website, healthbusinessgroup.com.